All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to um, this wonderful event. My name's uh, David Anstey. Um, I'm uh, honoured and slightly surprised to be the chair of Fiera Energy Foundation, which is doing wonderful uh, work. I I'd like to kick off by um, acknowledging the traditional owners um, of the land on, on, on which we're meeting, the Rawinjiri, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and most importantly, emerging. Um, feel free to to put in where you're calling in from um, and the uh, traditional owners of your lands in the in the chat as we go along. Um, we'd um, like to kick things off with um, a bit of colour and movement, um, a short uh, film, um, which is premiering here, hasn't been seen before um, anywhere anywhere else. And we'd um, like to um, uh, like to thank the the partners at AIFA. Um, the Australian Environmental Films Association, um, and especially the um, creative director, Blake. Um, uh, this is uh, a film made by um, MCPH. As a city, we've been through dark times when the way forward seemed uncertain and so much felt beyond our control. But Melbourne is powering back up. The lights are coming back on and we're coming back together. We've had a lot of time to think about what matters to us, about where we're heading, about who we are as a community. We've learned how resourceful and determined we can be and how much we can achieve when we work together. And that's why this is our moment to build a new future for our city, a bright future powered by clean, renewable energy, a brilliant future shaped by our vision and our voices a prosperous net zero future that our children can celebrate. Are you ready, Melbourne? Because that future is ours to make and to share. We know how to do it and we know we can do it. So let's get started right now in our homes, our streets, our businesses, our neighborhoods. Together as a community, we can light up this city we love like never before, together. Let's electrify Melbourne. Uh, if you are terrific. currently trying to sell an online course or a training program or a coaching program, I'd love to share with you the There we go. The advantages of having a premium account. Um, uh, that was great. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, look, now I'd um, like to introduce Alyssa Darbel um, from the government. Everybody, please be nice to her because she's been giving us money. Um, she's uh, had a very interesting career, um, learning to swear with Gordon Ramsay, running Moonlight Cinema. And thank you very much for that. That's a wonderful uh, institution. Um, and also um, work with the um, um, B Lab to help B Corporations, which is a, which I think is a terrific um, initiative. Uh, and also an alumni of the Cranlana um, Centre, which is a another amazing um, uh, amazing program and a real testament to you that um, that you're able to uh, to even get on that, let alone all the way through it. Um, over to you. Thanks, David. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for welcoming me. It's great to be here on this important day for the Metropolitan Melbourne Community Power Hub. I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we are meeting today, the people of the various nations that we're joining from, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I acknowledge that we live and work on the lands of the world's oldest and most sustainable culture. I acknowledge the deep connection to the earth of First Nations people and their invaluable contribution to our understanding of climate change and the environment. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Saul Griffith, Deborah Sykes, Fran McDonald, Peter Mercurio, and all members of the community who've joined us online today. Uh, I work for um, a particular part of the government called Sustainability Victoria. And Sustainability Victoria is a statutory delivery agency of the Victorian government. Our purpose is to accelerate Victoria's transition to a circular, climate resilient, clean economy. All of our work contributes to achieving three targets by 2030, 50% emissions reduction, 80% waste diverted from landfill, 
and 3,900 new clean economy jobs. Sustainability Victoria provides three unique services. Uh, we accelerate the infrastructure and innovation investment. We lead statewide education and behaviour change, and we deliver direct to community action in neighbourhoods and regions. Uh, to do this, we partner with um, Victorian industries and businesses, entrepreneurs, cutting edge research institutions, schools, households, individuals, community groups and governments, both Commonwealth and local, to deliver measurable impact, to start up, to speed up and to scale up. Sustainability Victoria uh, achieves impact due to our deep stakeholder connections and relationships in place and our understanding of community needs and aspirations informed by research data, research data market intelligence and behavioural insights. So what is um, the community telling us? There's vast knowledge in our communities with a desire to act on climate change that can be leveraged. However, communities, including industry, businesses and householders, have told us that there are many barriers to act. The community needs a backbone organisation that delivers change through facilitation, coordination and peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing. The community needs financing and new financing mechanisms to assist with making climate change projects a reality. And the community needs policy certainty and consistent ongoing support from government. So um, how is Sustainability Victoria responding to these needs? We worked with the state government and community groups to uh, establish this community power hubs program. It's now delivering seven community power hubs in Victoria. Initially as a pilot in 2017, the Victorian government committed $1.1 million to support three community power hubs in Ballarat, Bendigo and La Latrobe Valley. And it's exciting to see the projects that have developed from that initial pilot program. And most recently in 2020, the Victorian government committed uh, $5.94 million to support a further seven community power hubs to encompass every region in Victoria, including two in metropolitan Melbourne. Um, we're thrilled to work with sustainability groups across the state to deliver these power hubs. So what is a power hub? The community power hub is a partnership between government and the community, leveraging the strength of each. It involves a lead local community not-for-profit organisation acting as the regional host for other sustainability organisations. The hubs operate under a collective governance model to drive participation and engagement in local community renewable energy projects that are financially viable, technically feasible and socially acceptable. The Victorian government's community power hubs program is designed to empower communities to engage in the renewable energy transition and to help accelerate Victoria's transition to zero carbon emissions by 2050. The Metropolitan Melbourne Community Power Hub will help to support local community groups across the Melbourne region to, de to de develop and deliver community energy projects. I congratulate the Yarra Energy Foundation and the members of the Metropolitan Melbourne Community Power Hub on this formation of this power hub. Uh, these groups include the Yarra Climate Action Now, Darabin Climate Action Network, Glenira, Climate Action Network, Eastern Climate Action Network, Jewish Climate Network, Bayside Climate Crisis Action Group, Port Phillip Climate Action Network and Echo Centre, Collingwood Children's Farm and Lighter Footprints. We believe that community energy can reduce the Melbourne Metropolitan's area's carbon footprint, support creating local jobs and create economic benefits for the area by shifting energy consumption to locally produce renewable energy. Through the work of this power hub, we look forward to the growth of the community energy groups, renewable projects and local economic benefits throughout the metropolitan Melbourne. The expanded community power hubs program will see more communities supported and empowered to deliver local community energy projects. The community power hubs will provide the opportunity for local communities to be active participants in conversations and decisions around the transition to renewable energy. There'll be a one-stop shop for anyone after advice or ideas about how to get their business or community organisation to become more energy efficient. And why, why this focus on community energy? Uh, the state government is investing in community energy because it leads to increased community acceptance of renewable energy and its financial benefits stay in the community. These community owned and operated hubs will bring local renewable energy projects to life, drive investment in regional and metropolitan garden, 
<laughs> metropolitan gardens, uh, re regional and metropolitan Melbourne and create jobs and reduce energy bills. Community power hubs are also a very powerful way to increase participation in collective action on reducing emissions. So in conclusion, our community power hubs will be working on the front line, helping small businesses and community organisations to be part of the renewable revolution. Working at the grassroots level to empower our communities with the knowledge and support they need is crucial in making the transition to a low carbon, clean energy future. The Metropolitan Melbourne Community Power Hub will be a valuable asset for your communities and one that will deliver great social, environmental and economic value. Um, congratulations again. I love the short film. I'm super excited to hear Saul speak and the rest of the partners and um, I'm thrilled to be a representative of the state government today. It's an honour and a privilege to be a part of this project and I look forward to its ongoing success and hopefully ongoing support from government. Cheers. Thanks, Lisa, and, uh, and thanks also for your for your support. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Saul Griffith, probably needs a little introduction, but um, he does have an MIT from, uh, a PhD from MIT. He's worked for NASA, DARPA, and various other acronym-related organizations. He's recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant, so you can't get any better than that. He's the real deal. Um, he is the founder and chief scientist of rewiring some big country, beginning with A, but also Australia, which is much more important. Uh, and with that, um, over to you, Dr. Saul Griffiths, always well prepared. Um, I love working with Australians for the irreverence. Americans, that big country starting with A, take themselves far too seriously. Um, so with that, delighted to talk to everyone. Uh, I just wrote a book that my publisher makes me hold up every time I'm on Zoom. So, um, and in fact, I'm writing a book that will be called The Big Switch that's about rewiring Australia that should be out in January, um, which I should be working on, but I'm taking a break to talk to you all. Uh, I'm gonna launch into sharing my screen. We'll see how that goes. Someone can confirm that they're seeing the right presentation. Looks good, Sol, thanks. Terrific. Not quite working for me yet. All right, um, Rewiring Australia. I actually started an organization called Rewiring Australia three or four months ago. Um, curiously, I'm gonna build an argument that you guys are already doing and are on the front lines. And I think the best hope we have for the planet right now is that Australia decarbonizes really quickly, shows the world how economically favorable it is, how easy it is to do, and actually drags America with it. And if I get giving you a, my general perspective, I'm working very closely with the White House, but I actually think state governments in Australia are leading the world by three to five years. And given the failure of uh, the American domestic policy agenda, I mean, we did okay uh, with the Build Back Better program, et cetera, but, um, in America, the, the strategy of rewiring America, which I founded, is uh, is to revert to states and start to write, uh, run electrification pilots exactly like what you're doing. So you are leading the world, and I hope you go faster because the world needs you to. One last attempt at making the slides look right. Oh. Here we go. Rewiring Australia. There's my book cover again. Rewiring America, this is something I started in 2019 uh, to try and help the American politicians who were vying at that point for the US presidency, including Biden, uh, and is now very actively has been writing policy for, for the last uh, 12 months and is now shifting to focusing on rewiring communities across America. Uh, just quickly on urgency, which is good context for your project for reasons that will become obvious in a second. You sort of all, everyone saw the, the sort of rough failure at Glasgow. Glasgow was hoping to get us to come in below that blue line in the middle, in, meaning increase our pledges and targets. It didn't, so we're going to be stuck in the three degree world of current policies, maybe, and that's if everyone abides by it. I think that's true unless we go faster. Um, this is the pathway that you need to be on if you want to hit one and a half degrees and you're not relying on the pyramid scheme that is negative emissions. 
Um, and really it means we've got to do more than 50% reductions by 2030. So it needs to be very quick. Um, you can just sort of summarize that as a one and a half degree and a two degree path uh, with no negative emissions. That, that's what it looks like. And here's the slide that I want you to, well, not quite. This is another slide, which is called the technology adoption slide. So this is the history of the adoption of things like a color television was invented and it took about 25 years for 100% of households to have color tele television. Um, cars, the dotted line, it took about 50 years to get to about 80%. That's called the adoption rate. With climate change, we need 100% decarbonization and we need it to happen quickly. So if you think about the things that you'll be decarbonizing in rewiring Melbourne, it's the heating of people's homes, the furnace, the water heater, the stovetop, the natural lifetime of all of those machines is between 10 and 25 years. And so you literally need to think that every single hot water heater that's being replaced in Melbourne starting tomorrow needs to be replaced with an electric one, preferably a heat pump. Same is true for every car, same is true for you know, all of these things if we're gonna stay on target for being two degrees. So that's, I think, a nice way to focus the mind on the level of effort required. Um, quick summary of Australian emissions at the top there, that's the emissions that don't count on us, that are, but do originate in our, on our soil. That's our exports of coal and natural gas. About one third of the domestic economy, actually the energy and the emissions is exported because we are using that energy domestically to mine the coal and mine the natural gas and make the sheep and make the um, iron ore and then export it. So really what you're doing and what I think is what is the nearest term realistic focus for climate action is domestic emissions and things that are focused around the household and around commercial businesses. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. Um, just a quick history. The first energy crisis we had in the world was um, the oil crisis of 1973, most countries didn't even have a Department of Energy, including the US. Uh, Nixon quickly had a couple of boffins draw this diagram. This is a Sankey diagram that looked at the energy input to the US economy, what sectors it went into, electric generation, residential, industrial transportation. They said, well, we can solve this oil crisis with efficiency because we're missing 15% of our fuel. So if we make all of our cars more efficient and all of our appliances more efficient, that will work out. That was the general summary that the environmentalist movement had for 50 years. Waste is bad, efficiency is good. It gave us efficiency as policy. And everyone's seen Energy Star and more efficient appliances. Everyone's seen more efficient corporate average fuel economy standards. Those are the US car fuel economy standards, they perpetuate the world's automotive fleets. But um, nothing really changed in the last 20 years. Efficiency kept a, a cap on growth, but didn't actually start losing emissions. Because as I think now we're realizing climate crisis is a different kind of crisis to the original energy crisis that shaped the nature of the debate. We can't efficiency our way to a zero. Um, we have to outright change. This is just to show that I did my homework and I found the very first Australian version of that diagram. Um, it was from this book in 1975 when we were gonna go all nuclear, believe it or not. Thank God that didn't happen, I think. And then this is what it currently looks like if you go and download how Australians use energy. When I look at this diagram, I actually see this. I see all of the machines because I think we're now should be having a conversation about what machines do we need replaced so we get to zero as soon as possible. And that's a story about the small number of large machines the last 50 years. That's the fight that we're having with coal-fired power plants, with natural gas plants. Um, and that has typically been the focus of the Australian energy conversation. It's about what we about these big, large capital machines but it's missing the demand side. That's where we use energy in Australia, which is a huge number of small machines that last 25 years. That's our cars, that's our hot water heaters, that's our kitchen stoves. Um, and you have to decarbonize both of them at the same time. Climate policy traditionally lived over here on supply with large machines, large corporations and their lobby groups. But I think with a revolution we're about to see in Australia, particularly, is that over here on the demand side of the decisions that determine our quality of our life, the majority of our emissions and our household economics. 
So it's a possibility for a change. Electrification is the answer. And I'm just the, the reason to write the book I did was just to try and get the world to start to ignore the false gods of carbon sequestration and hydrogen and other things and understand that it, electricity is where the game is at. And it turns out electrification is the efficiency we're always looking for. If you fill the, the forward ranger on the left with petrol, about 80% of that energy is wasted. You can make it slightly more efficient. That's the mill bar. Or if you electrify it, that Ford Ranger will use about one third or less of the energy of the petrol version. Same goes for natural gas heaters. That's my bad cartoon of the Victorian natural gas heater on the left. It wastes a bunch of energy. You can make it slightly more efficient, the middle one, or if you go to electric heat pump, you'll reduce that energy need by two thirds to three quarters on the right. Um, same is true for water heaters and same is true of our thermoelectric generation of our electricity. The Australian coal natural gas thermoelectric generation fleet is running about 30% efficient. So about 70% goes to waste up the smokestack. People are arguing for a slight more efficiency, but the real efficiency win is if you generate that electricity with wind and solar hydroelectricity, you eliminate huge amounts of wasted energy. What does that really mean? Um, for Australia, you could actually run the domestic economy. Um, as you can see in this slide, the domestic economy currently runs on 6,500 petajoules a year. If we just electrify everything, the whole economy will run on less than half of that energy. It's an underappreciated uh, efficiency win for Australians, or as you might say, all the Australia, half the energy. Um, you don't really, you know, it gets us around the, uh, the culture war of what we have to lose because we don't. This is the same sized cars, same size homes, just we are electrifying all the appliances. So we can in fact uh, keep the Australian dream going uh, and do it um, much better with electricity. So what do we have to win? And I think this is really, sounds like what your community group is focusing on. I really applaud that. It's our households, it's our castles. I think this is the theme that's hopefully gonna change elections in Australia and focus the populace on what we have to do and what we have to win. First thing is to understand that 42% of the domestic emissions emanate from a small number of decisions Australians make around the kitchen table. That means what fuel goes in your car, what's heating your home, where do you get your electricity and how are the fuels made? Um, I'm gonna skip something. The average Australian household, $75,000 a year is what it spends four and a half to five thousand dollars a year it spends on energy so it's a significant amount that's for the average for the lowest income houses it can be as much as 10 percent of their monthly expenditure so it's a significant thing if you can lower energy costs this is this is what it shows you the lowest 20 percent of households are spending eight percent and the highest income are spending five percent i want us to think of our castles as infrastructure I think we've had an environmental movement that was trying to save the world with stainless steel water bottles and recyclable paper cups, like everyday small decisions. But actually it's the small number of big decisions that you make every decade that the infrastructure of your life. If you make these decisions correctly, then living zero carbon is easy. That means when your stove goes out, replace it with an electric induction. When your car <laughs> kicks the bucket, replace it with an electric um, et cetera, et cetera. And if we all stick to that schedule, that's how we get our 50% emissions by 2030 and we stay on target. Um, to enable it, we're gonna need solar on our rooftops, community generation, particularly the Australian solar miracle is fundamental. We're gonna up, need to upgrade the electrical circuit in the home. That's the load center on the left there, add batteries and add vehicle charges, probably one or two per house. Um, oh, sorry, a couple of the slides are a little bit wrong. What does this mean? This is the uh, current Australian household, uses 13 kilowatt hours a day on the left. If you include the waste of the generation on the grid, it's about 30. Um, and if you include all of the energy we use for fueling our cars, it's about 100 kilowatt hours a day. Um, if we electrify the whole household, it lowers by two thirds, about 34 kilowatt hours a day. And so that's, the, that's, the, that's what we have to win just by switching over to these electric appliances. If we do it in 2021, people have tried, it's still a little bit difficult, it's still hard to find a tradie who'll do a good job installing your heat pump. It's still a little hard to find an electric vehicle in Australia for a host of reasons. 
And what this is showing is it would cost the Australian household on average about $5,000 more a year in next year if they were to electrify completely. So that's affordable for the high income houses. But the astonishing thing that's happening is that by 2025, the cost of the electric cars will be the same as the cost of the petrol car. Uh, solar will continue to come down, battery prices are halving, and we start to see you know, in 2024, 2025, the, av the average Australian or Victorian household will be starting to save $1,000 a year on energy. And because by 2030, electric vehicles will be cheaper than petrol cars, they'll actually be saving $5,500 a year. Think about how impactful that is for low and middle income households in Victoria. Um, you can model it out for the whole country. This is the sort of annual spend so if we spend about 12 billion dollars over the next five or six years in australia subsidizing it so we get to that point where it starts to save us money then we start to seriously save and eventually we'll start we'll be saving 40 or 50 billion dollars a year as a country so we should be we should put to bed this idea or this conversation that renewables are going to cost us more we've had the australian rooftop solar miracle now we've got to surf that wave by electrifying the rest of our lives um Big headline there, and that's, hopefully I came in on time, knowing that you gave me a very hard deadline. <laughs> um, how do we do? Thanks very much, Saul. That was, uh, that was terrific and really interesting. Some of the, uh, some of the bits and pieces in there are, are fascinating. Um, and uh, as everybody starts making those decisions, um, the big ones as well as the small ones. Let's hope they uh, they head the right way and that we uh, continue to see some encouragement from uh, the local. Um, yeah. If I've got if I've got sixty seconds more to talk about the specifics, I really think that it now federal governments can can provide money to states, but actually it's state government incentives, it's local government building codes. Um, training programs that really, really move the needle here. If you're going to take the Victorian and Melbourne community with you on this electrification journey, it's really worthwhile focusing at every decision you make. How do we make it easier for the next house? How do we lower the soft costs? How do we increase and do capacity building in the trading network so that the next job will be easier? Um, and how do we build the supply chain to get this done. We're, we're about 10, 10 times underperforming on all of those vectors right now. Um, but the, the, you know, the first city in the world that proves the economics will have a lot to teach the world. We'll have a lot of little startups in his community that will make a lot of money selling that, uh, those ideas to the world. So I commend you for your efforts. So it's a really interesting point you make. I mean, on the one hand, there's the financials, the sort of the, the hard-nosed spreadsheet around things, which, as you say, is heading in the right direction. But then the other side is the soft cost. So, um, you know, people believing it and wanting to do it, um, the availability of expertise and skills to be able to to be able to do it, the availability of, of um, these sort of items. What, you know, other, other than just providing incentives, which addresses the cash side of things, what what can what can we do to address those other sort of softer softer barriers? Um, you know, I know two people in Melbourne who've gone all electric and they were wealthy enough and patient enough to do it. Um, and there's more and more people taking that journey every day and it's getting a little bit easier. Um, but I really think the, and it's something that Rewiring Australia is going to start doing as much as we can all over the country next year. It's community pilots that try to do total electrification. So, a lot of that is about building the institutional memory in the, in the tradespeople network to, to do the work. It's to figure out the last, the last few meters of integration. You know, it's, it turns out having the computer that speaks to the electric vehicles and the battery and the heat pump and the stove still doesn't quite work seamlessly. It's making all of those things work well. We're still pushing the boundaries of what's happening on the distribution grid. There's been a huge focus on rooftop solar, which has been great, um, but we now are starting to run into problems balancing the local distribution grid under a substation. I think you know you've talked about your community doing community batteries. That is one of the huge solutions. You would like the batteries to be on the distribution grid side of the house, not on the garage side of the house. So I think community batteries 
are a big part of the solution. So I think it's running those pilots. And then it really is just about, um, you know, looking at your fire codes and how they impact the cost of installing these things. Fire codes largely were designed for natural homes that had natural gas in them. So do you rewrite the fire codes that will eliminate some of the soft co costs associated with homes that no longer will have a flammable gas in them? Think about that. Um, I think there's a lot of work, which is the small policy work that happens at city councils and, um, and at state energy offices around uh, doing all of that optimization. Yeah, that's really interesting. It'd be great to see lower home and home and contents if you if you didn't have gas. Look, so we have hit deadline now. Thank you very much for that. It was an excellent presentation. Uh, we really appreciate you coming in and, uh, and giving us a few pointers. Um, look, now moving along to, um, to one of our partners in the um, Energy Hub um, from Port Phillip, um, Deborah um, Sykes. Deborah's trained as a nurse, which is um, a very valuable skill to have in, these, uh, in this day and age. Um, she's worked for the UN, um, but most importantly, she's now the proud owner of a new EV. Uh, and she specified red to make sure it goes faster, which is a very... Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, so when I heard um, a, a politician talk about that we were going to have a gas-led recovery, we bit the bullet and uh, we've gone all electric, including the red EV, which does go very fast. And I can tell you, it hasn't ruined my weekends. We've just come back from uh, canoeing on the Glenelg River near the South Australian border. And the car's filthy because it's had all the camping stuff and it's worked beautifully. So, um, so I'm part of uh, PCAN, the Port Phillip Emergency Climate Action Network. Uh, and I'm also a member of the Echo Centre in the city of Port Phillip. Um, so for me, I was lucky enough to go to both the Rio de Janeiro Conference on Sustainable Development, the Rio Plus 20, and the COP21 Paris Climate Change Conferences. Um, and we were presenting on what could happen and what was happening at the grassroots level in Victoria at that time. And it was then that I saw how much strength community-based climate action could achieve. So what I like best about being part of Pekin, who is um, a member of the Metro Community Power Hub, is that it's powered by a community to create big picture change. So we're working in partnership with the Metro Community Power Hub to create and support an energy project that means something to our local community, as all the partners are. So for PECAN, we're looking at developing a community battery with the aim of reducing community greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we expect better health outcomes and a better sense of community well-being, and of course, benefiting the overall Melbourne emissions. The reason we chose that project is because 90% of the dwellings in Port Phillip are medium or high density compared with 33% in Greater Melbourne and nearly 50% of our residents are renting. So as discussed earlier, it's, it's a really powerful kind of a solution or part solution to all our problems. So we expect to work closely with our local council and we hope our work will assist them to achieve some of their goals in emissions reductions as well as the state governments. But also we're forging strong relationships with the other roundtable partners, uh, which I think is both really empowering and grounding. So you get that true sense of community. Another inspiring aspect for us is that we can understand what the local energy usage is and what our output actually is. And we can help build local capacity and skills to make sure that the benefits are realized in our neighborhood. For instance, the Echo Centre is partnering with the Metro Community Power Hub to run an energy literacy course. And it's exciting to be able to empower the people in our community. So it's uh, great to be part of work that's kickstarting more renewable energy projects rather than just watching with bated breath some of our politicians messing around in this space. And being part of a community organisation means that we've got a really strong platform of communication that we can bring to this kind of work. 
And the other thing I've found that working with the Metro Community Power Hub has actually strengthened that sense of community and can-do attitude. Lots of our members are really just sort of gagging to be part of this. There's a lot of energy out there in, in our people because we all want the best for um, our world. So, yep, that's from me. So do it. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Deborah. And, uh, now I'd like to introduce um, Fran McDonald, who's Executive Officer of WAGA, the Western Alliance of Greenhouse Action. Um, which is uh, seven local seven local governments. And look, I, I really, I love Fran's story. This is a, a, a real story of, um, of coming from a background of adversity and, and, and disadvantage and, and really winning through and, 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 and becoming a, you know, becoming a better person. Um, Fran trained as a lawyer. I know you all commiserate, but has managed to better herself um, and is now doing good for the community rather than bad. So over to you, Fran, thank you very much. Oh, David, I wondered where that was going. <laughs> um, yeah, so look, thanks so much for uh, inviting me to speak at, at this launch today. And I really want to build on what Deborah said about the, um, the real importance of community by just giving you the local government perspective. So just to build on that bio a little bit, WAGA is one of four greenhouse alliances in Metro Melbourne, seven greenhouse alliances across the state. And uh, the others are NAGA, the Northern Alliance, which includes the City of Melbourne, EGA, the Eastern Alliance, and uh, SECA, the Southeast Council's Climate Change Alliance. And we do work together closely already, and this is another opportunity for us to work uh, together, I think, too. So look, the way the councils are really keen to work with the Metro Community Power Hub, and in fact, we got in touch uh, with the team at Yarra Energy Foundation as soon as we heard about it, and we we're already promoting the hub services in the community, and that's because it aligns so closely with our goals. Like so many other local governments, most of the WAGA councils have declared a climate emergency and they all have strong emissions reduction targets. And at the regional level uh, for WAGA, we're currently developing a community, a community campaign for 100% renewables. I really like that title, Let's Electrify Melbourne. Maybe we can have Let, Let's Electrify the West. Um, and we know, as Saul says, that our task is to electrify everything and switch to renewables as quickly as possible and show others how to do it. And also, as Saul said, local government has a strong role. Um, but we know we can't do it alone. And a partnership between our councils, community organisations, the state government and a trusted advisor in Yarra Energy Foundation, I think really does have the potential to achieve the switch. So it's an opportunity to help all the residential and business communities of Melbourne take part and create that environment where using renewable energy is just known as the essential thing to do. And it is doable with a strong coordinated message. I mean, that's the thing. We look at, at you know, some source graphs and we go, oh, it looks so hard. But in fact, I think we can do it and this is the way. Um, and we need high quality advice and technology and services to make it easy for people. And we need targeted programs different sectors and groups in the community so no one misses out that's really important and we also need the innovation that i think is the promise of this program and on that to say a bit more about that i think it's an opportunity to do projects at scale so we've seen how the uh, community power hub model works in regional victoria and uh, as alicia said it's about the power of collective action so for Melbourne, you know, the, the capital city of, uh, of our state, uh, the hub really opens up the possibility of very ambitious new energy projects to take right across the city, leveraging the power of all those stakeholders. So, you know, the local government people as well as state, as well as all those community organisations, business organisations, the community leaders and so on. And as Saul says, what we do need is those, are those new community models of total electrification plus renewables. And that's what we want to achieve here. So I'd just like to say um, good luck, except uh, actually we plan to participate and help make it happen. So 
I think I'll just end by saying what we're really looking forward to the collaboration. Thank you. Thanks, Fran. And the best way to have good luck is to is to make some of your own. Absolutely. Um, so uh, finally, I'd, I'd like to um, introduce um, Peter Mercurio, uh, who's the manager of the Metro Community Power Hub. Um, Peter gave up a very successful acting career in blockbuster movie, <laughs> um, uh, ditched the Hollywood lifestyle because he knows what's right and what's best. Um, you may have seen him in Blue Healers, but now he is uh, he is doing far more important work for Yarra Energy Foundation. Um, over to you, Peter. Thanks, David. Appreciate that intro, as always. Um, first of all, I just want to thank all our presenters here today. So, Alicia, Fran, and Deb um, couldn't be more pleased for your contribution uh, to the launch of the Metro Community Power Hub. Uh, for myself and the MCPH team, it's been an absolute privilege in putting together their foundations of the Metro Community Power Hub. Excitingly, more and more climate community groups are joining us, such as Empower from the Mornington Peninsula and Eastern Climate Action Melbourne, um, which are in the Maroondah Whitehorse area. I think as we all know, over the past two years, Melbourne has gone through and has come through one of the great challenges of our time. And with that same spirit, we can tackle the greatest challenge of our time, climate change. For years, our climate community groups have excelled at campaigning for all levels of government to declare a climate emergency and local government right across Melbourne has responded. Now we can seek a new and innovative way to connect, collaborate and achieve, carving out deep emissions reductions through the Metro Community Power Hub. Improving access for our most vulnerable communities and building the awareness of the Metro Community Power Hub to the entire Melbourne community will accelerate our transition to a cleaner energy future. That's our goal. And by working together, we should have this licked in a couple of months, easy. The dawn of a new optimism around the decarbonisation of Melbourne is here. Onwards, upwards, and with courage. Our castle infrastructure, as Sol mentioned earlier, is available today. Through our comprehensive vetting process, we have a number of preferred suppliers, tradespeople who align strongly with our purpose. All the information is available at www.mcph.org.au. If you're interested in participating, register your details on this newly launched website. We'll have regular updates and news items on the site. So please share with your colleagues, friends, and families. I'll just do a quick share of my screen. So everyone can see here. I'm very proud of the work that the team has done to bring this all together in a few months. Uh, there's 12 councils right across Melbourne who are participating today, as well as 12 climate community groups. Um, and it's no easy feat bringing us all together under one banner, which is the Metro Community Power Hub. So I couldn't thank Sustainability Victoria enough for helping us achieve this feat already. So currently we've got heaps of people coming through asking about heat pumps, asking about uh, reverse cycle split systems, uh, asking about solar and batteries, EVs, currently doing a PhD in my part-time hours on that. So please give us a call. Um, there's plenty of information and this will be updated all throughout the life of, of the uh, Metro Community Power Hub. Got heaps of resources where we've got a lot of um, recordings of events that we've already already held. Um, more than 600 people have attended these events and these webinars. Uh, Judith Lucy, a, a member now of the Eco Centre, uh, showing her ways. So please do get involved. Tell your family, tell your friends, tell whomever that you come across that this actually exists, that the pathway to getting off gas and electrifying your home exists today. Um, we'll help you do that. That's our job. That's our role at the Yarra Energy Foundation. David, that's all from me. Terrific, Peter. Thank you very much. I, uh, I can see the skills coming to the fore there. So look, <laughs> we've had um, over 120 people on, on this seminar. Um, as Peter have said, has said, we've engaged with, um, with well over 500 through our, our other seminars. Um, I think the, the three key messages out of this are get along to um, your community uh, energy hub, have a chat with the people in there, see what you can do to electrify um, your organisation. Um, uh, secondly, get on to electrifying, um, cleaner, better, faster, cheaper. If you can get it in red, that's better. Um, and buy Saul's book, otherwise his publisher won't be happy and won't give him time off to do these sorts of things again. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, especially Sustainability Victoria for your support of the organisation. There's, the, uh, there's the book again, thank you, thank you Saul. Um, and, uh, and thank you very much to, our, to, to the speakers. You did a terrific job. Um, so thanks a lot. As a city, we've been through dark times when the way forward seemed uncertain, 
and so much felt beyond our control. But Melbourne is powering back up. The lights are coming back on and we're coming back together. We've had a lot of time to think about what matters to us, about where we're heading, about who we are as a community. We've learned how resourceful and determined we can be and how much we can achieve when we work together. And that's why this is our moment to build a new future for our city, a bright future powered by clean, renewable energy, a brilliant future shaped by our vision and our voices, a prosperous net zero future that our children can celebrate. Are you ready, Melbourne? Because that future is ours to make and to share. We know how to do it and we know we can do it. So let's get started right now in our homes, our streets, our businesses, our neighbourhoods. Together, as a community, we can light up this city we love like never before. Together, let's electrify Melbourne.